Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight. We'll be getting started in just a moment. So if I may impose upon you to take your seats. We're just going to let in a few people at the door in just a second, allow them to get settled, and then we'll get the evening underway. Thank you all so much for your patience. Pay no attention to the man walking in front of the stage. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is John, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the RBC Convention Center Winnipeg is located on Treaty 1 territory, the home and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Inanu. Cree and Dakota peoples and in the national homeland of the Red River Métis. We recognize and give thanks to Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory, which is the source of the Convention Center's clean drinking water. We are, of course, gathered here tonight to celebrate the incredible life, work, and words of the Honorable Murray Sinclair as we gather in recognition of his incredible new memoir, Who We Are, Four Questions for a Life and a Nation. We are naturally deeply saddened that Senator Sinclair is unable to join us in person tonight, but we are grateful for multiple reasons. The first is that he is here in the city taking care of himself and his health after giving so much to all those around him. The second is that despite our sadness, we were so gratified to see the outpouring of support from attendees, so thank you all, and from the community at large. We knew the book had to be acknowledged, as did its publisher and all involved, and we're thrilled that our guests this evening could join us to celebrate Senator Sinclair's work. And we're also enormously pleased that Senator Sinclair could record some audio so that he could play an essential part in this evening as well. I'm going to continue the gratitude because we're also enormously thankful to McClelland and Stewart for making this evening a possibility and feel quite humbled that the Honorable Murray Sinclair would entrust us with playing a small part in welcoming his book into the world. We're also very grateful to all at the RBC Convention Center Winnipeg for their generous contributions and inimitable organization. In the words of Jody Wilson-Raybould, this book is a testament to and reflects the legacy of a life of service, leadership, and resilience. There are lessons we can all take from these reflections on a life's journey and on the journey of Canada. This makes it all even more appropriate to be here in the Skyview Ballroom, overlooking a city, a province, and a nation that owe so much to the man we've gathered here tonight to recognize. Here to introduce this evening, please give a very warm welcome to the publisher of McClelland and Stewart, a member of the Sinclair family, the wonderful Stephanie Sinclair. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so grateful to everyone for coming out tonight. Um, as John said, I am a proud member of the Sinclair family and the lucky publisher of McCollin and Stewart. I'm going to put these on so I can actually see what I'm reading. Um, I, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here uh, for the launch of Who We Are, Four Questions for a Life and a Nation by Murray Sinclair. There are many interesting stories behind how this book came to be. We've all been waiting decades for Murray's memoir. It took a few different starts and formats, and I'm incredibly proud of where we landed. Murray always said he wanted this book to sound like him, to reflect his storytelling. He didn't want a traditional memoir. He wanted to tell stories on the page and offer his wisdom, his kindness, his insights, and his humor through these stories. And I'm confident and proud that Who We Are reflects that. Having personally spent more time with Murray in person and in print over the last few years, I find myself a better person for it. And I know that if people across Turtle Island come to this book, the country will be better for it too. Thank you to all of you for coming to this conversation. We had planned tonight for Murray to be up here, and it's heartbreaking that he can't join us in the room here tonight to receive and participate in the celebration he so deserves. But it would be more heartbreaking to not have this launch to honor Murray's work, Murray's legacy, and his extraordinary contributions to this country, to our community, and to all of us individually. 
I need to extend an enormous thank you to Nigan and Danae Sinclair for their tireless support. I was very annoying over the last couple of weeks, peppering with lots of texts and notes. Um, so really, I'm, I'm, I don't even know where you are anymore. There you are. I'm very, very grateful, um, because it's really without them, this wouldn't have happened tonight. And also to the team at McNally Robinson for their generosity, patience, and grace in moving this critical conversation and celebration forward. Before inviting Nigan and Tanya onto the stage, I thought it would be nice for all of us to hear from Murray directly. Um, so we've got a special audio clip to play for everyone tonight. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, this is Stephanie Sinclair. I'm sitting here with Murray, uh, and we thought it might be nice for me to have the chance to ask him a few questions to share with you tonight. So we're gonna start with, what prompted you to write this book? Well, it was a, um, a, a kind of a general desire to keep um, the grandchildren informed about the family because I had just suffered from a TIA, which is a small stroke, uh, and the year before um, Sarah was born, and I was thinking about what I should do in order to ensure that she would know about my family. And so I started writing letters to her. And in the letters, I would tell her things about my brothers and my sister and my grandparents and things such as that. And at the same time, I thought it was important to give her some lessons that they had taught me. And I wanted them to know um, because there were other uh, grandchildren as well. I wanted them to know that uh, I would always be there to help them, but more importantly that I would also ensure that they could understand what was happening around them. And uh, I've since learned that uh, this is a common element among many parents. I was once uh, giving a lecture to teachers. And uh, one of the teachers, after hearing my lecture, said, after he had uh, invited his children to have dinner, uh, that uh, he invited them to share their day. And he said, they went around the table and they spoke to the, the children of the, of the father. And he, said that my 12-year-old um, spoke up and he recited the story of residential schools and uh, what he understood from the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he said, I very clearly remember that when uh, dinner was over, that he looked at me and he said, Daddy, I don't want to ever let you do this, do that to me. Mm. He wanted to be sure that his dad would protect him. And that's a common element among parents in particular, when they react to this and react to how their children are feeling, to recognize that um, it may not be something that they would worry about, but also to recognize that it's something that their children will worry about. And so I would say that uh, this is not about building fear. This is more about ensuring that they understand the importance of feeling protected, feeling loved, and feeling the assurance of family. Mm. And I was uh, taken aback by people who who speak out as though this is not important to any of that. And I don't understand why they have that attitude. But that's this, uh, this attitude towards the residential school experience and that it will never happen again is one that we must never take for granted. Uh -huh. Because it's um, one that we can show from experience not only amongst ourselves, but also um, from your experience as parents, that 
your children are as concerned about this as uh, the residential school children were. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important uh, thought mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that your children are reassured by this. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the structure of the book, it was always really important to you to not have it be sort of a straight autobiography. Like I was born on this day and have it go through sort of the chronology of your life. Do you want to speak to that at all? Well, yeah, it was initially um, the easy way to start. Mm -hmm. um, and to start when I was born a little guy and running through the streets of Selkirk. Uh, but I realized that that was not really working for me. And so I uh, revamped my approach to things. And I thought amongst all of these things that happened to me, that it was far more important, important to uh, listen to the voices of those kids who were with me at that time and to my own voice mm -hmm. because I had been victimized by other children. I'd been victimized by other adults, but just as well, I had been supported by my grandparents, by my uh, aunts and uncles, by my older brother, and they were very attentive to my needs. And so I always felt secure in a family situation, even though uh, I didn't have a mother who had passed away when my youngest brother was born. Mm -hmm. But I still had a family, mm -hmm. and I always had a family. It wasn't one aunt or the other. Uh, I always had somebody who was going to take care of us. Mm -hmm. I still remember my, my Aunt Louise, who said to us one time when we were playing on the staircase, he said, if you guys fall from that staircase and kill yourself, you are going to get such a spanking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that aunties would do, mm -hmm. and they say. And, uh, and that's difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the beautiful things about the book, and have it, having it not be in that chronology, is that you carry the family through the whole book. Yeah. Oh, they're not sort of left, you know, at any point. Really, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, they were... They were very common experiences, I think, for just about everybody. And so I write about many of the experiences I had, but from the perspective that these experiences are worth talking about, mm -hmm. are worth learning from. And uh, so we did that. Uh, we learned from them. We talked about them. And I share many of those thoughts in, in my book. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And is there anything you want to say to the audience at the lunch and tonight? I think the audience needs to understand that you have a um, you have a, a, a responsibility here to be able to share this with everybody out there who's listening and watching and who's here. So with one voice, you should be yelling, hoorah, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear it. <laughs> Amazing. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we are recording tonight, so you will hear all the hurrahs. I will rally them all. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and see you guys tonight. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh. So we are, thank you to uh, McNally Robinson. We are like recording this for Murray so he can hear everyone here tonight. So let's give him a big hurrah. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm actually gonna take a picture for him too so we can see this beautiful crowd. This is, you know, not a normal thing to do. So thanks for bearing with me, but it's amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna text it to him uh, very shortly. Um, okay, so now about our presenters tonight. Nikon Sinclair is Anishinaabe St. Peter's Little Peguis and an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. He's a regular commentator on Indigenous issues on CTV, CBC, and APTN, and his written work can be found in the pages of the Exile Edition of Native Canadian Fiction and Drama, 
Newspapers like The Guardian and online with CBC Books, Canada writes. Nigan obtained his BA in education at the University of Winnipeg before completing an MA in Native and African American Literatures at the University of Oklahoma and a PhD in First Nations and American Literatures from the University of British Columbia. Nigan is the editorial director of the Debway series with Portage and Maine Press and the best-selling author of Winnipeg, published by McClellan and Stewart earlier this year. Please welcome Nigan to the stage. Tanya Talaga is of Anishinaabe and Polish descent and was born and raised in Toronto. She is a member of Fort William First Nation. Her mother was raised on the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation and Treaty 9. She's the claimed author of the national bestseller, Seven Fallen Feathers, which won the RBC Taylor Prize, the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing, and the First Nation Communities Read Young Adult Adult Award. A finalist for the Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for Nonfiction and the BC National Award for Canadian Nonfiction, the book was also CBC's Nonfiction Book of the Year and a Globe and Mail Top 100 book. Tanya was the 2017-2018 Atkinson Fellow in Public Policy and the 2018 CBC Massey Lecturer. She's also the author of the national bestseller, All Our Relations, Finding the Path Forward. For more than 20 years, she was a journalist at the Toronto Star and is now a regular columnist at the Globe and Mail. Tanya Talaga is the founder of Makwa Creative, a production company formed to elevate Indigenous voices and stories. Tanya's most recent book, The Knowing, was an instant bestseller. Please join me in welcoming Tanya to the stage. Ready to go? Her bag. Just one bag, though. No, I just need one. <laughs> You're right to the airport after this. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to so. sleep first. I'm going to sleep right. first. But uh, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but uh, Tanya literally bent her entire schedule out of shape to be here tonight. So way to go, Tanya. Flew all the way here. And so mostly because I was like, I'm not doing this alone. So <laughs> I said to Steph, I'm not going to do this alone. So here I am. Uh, so it's really nice to be here. So bonjour, name I'm Agaduk. Nigan wave them to dish the cost. Namago shendo dem ni men wendo mo my ayin. It's nice to be here. It's nice to recognize all of you, see all of you. Uh, I've been doing some of my own stuff involving my book, uh, and I find every launch it's like a this is your life moment, and all these people from different walks of life who know way too much in sort of a Manitoba context. So this is one of those moments where like, I don't want to meet any of your eyes because you know, you know way too much and you know way too much. You're not allowed to talk, right? So anyways, so it's nice to be here. So thanks to everybody and especially thanks to my family who's all over here, who are all done some incredible stuff to, they do some incredible stuff, A, to put up with my dad and then B, to make sure that all of this stuff happens because without our family, really none of this, none of the book, none of the event, of course, none of us would really be here. So our family really deserves so much of the uh, credit for getting us to this point and really uh, a really beautiful moment where my father, I remember when we were assembling this book, there were many nights when I was like, I don't think this is going to happen. We're never going to get this done. And I actually said that to Stephanie a whole bunch of times, but Stephanie was resilient and kept us going. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to bring this book to you tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the process of assembling the book. Uh, Tanya is going to talk a little bit about her experiences working with dad and... Um, and then uh, we have a few extra treats for you at the end, which we're going to um, we're going to have some chance to see some stuff that's in the book. Uh, I know each one of you have the book. It's only been really out for the public for a couple days now, uh, but the re the reception has been tremendous and wonderful because I think we all, in different steps, and all the different people who are here, have all uh, been touched by the work of my father in some way or another. Uh, thinking way back to his first moment uh, out in St. Peter's and growing up in our traditional territory uh, just across the river from our traditional homelands after our family had been removed in 1907 by the government of Canada, the province of Manitoba, the town of Selkirk. 
And as we, uh, my great grandfather, Henry James Sinclair, was left and tried to make a living in what's now Peguis First Nation and finding that so difficult, but also missing the river because he was a boat maker and he was a fisherman. And so bringing that family back after only a couple years uh, to then spend time and bring the family back to this territory. Uh, and of course, that changed my father's life, the uh, parameters and the relationship that he would have with the Red River, which is such a significant part of this book. And then hearing the story of my great-grandmother, uh, Catherine Samard, and her stories of being at Fort Alexander Residential School, and then one day having this uh, dapper guy show up who was interested in finding a wife at the school, and she threatened all of the other girls at the school, don't you dare touch him, because he's mine. Which is one kick-butt granny, great-granny that I had. A great, sorry, granny that I had, so Catherine Samard. And, uh, and the fact that she saved my father's life. That if it weren't for her and her uh, sheer luck also to experience life a little differently as a residential school person, uh, she got to live with the nuns because she was a good cook. And many people ask the question, how do we get a Murray Sinclair? Or how do we get someone who uh, can think the things or say the things that he does? To be honest, it's just a fluke. It's just, a, it's just luck. Part of that is because my great, uh, my grandmother, my great grandmother, uh, she was able to miss a little bit of those horrible experiences because she spent time with the nuns. And that uh, his grandmother, my great grandmother, then at the time in which my grandfather wasn't able to parent because of the traumas that he had experienced at that same residential school, uh, that she took the children and she took my father, uh, she took my auntie, and my, uh, my two uncles, and she took them into the house, even though she was already quite old by then, as well as with, and she put them under the care of each one of my aunts. And that my father uh, would be cared for by one aunt, and my uncle Richard be, would be cared for another one, my uncle Buddy, my auntie Diane, each one of them were assigned an auntie. And he tells the story in here of how a child welfare system developed of love and kinship and a model that all of us can follow. And then going on to the platform for his career, going into high school and achieving his greatest moment in his life by far. I mean, we could talk about the TRC and the senator, like none of this compares with the fact that in 1969, he got athlete of the year at Selkirk Comprehensive School, <laughs> which by the way, he brings up every 10 minutes in my life. I'm like, hey, dad, look, I got a PhD. But he's like, did you get athlete of the year from Selkirk <laughs> School? And that's a typical Murray Sinclair story right there. And so, um, and then going on to becoming a, a lawyer and then of course, slipping and falling within his own life and experiencing a great deal of pain and feelings around inadequacy involving his own life, not knowing his own culture. There's a really beautiful story in here about traveling to Wales and being asked by a, uh, a house parent that he was spending when he was in cadets of why, why don't you know your culture or what is it that you know about your culture or what is it that you can tell me about your culture and your nation and he didn't have a lot of answers and so that set him forth on a journey going forward into becoming a lawyer and eventually then returning to ceremony and, and, uh, and then at that point he had children. And so the greatest part of this book is when I'm born. So just please, please, ear. I actually marked that page. So the most important moment of the book is on page 173, when I show up and my sister Danae shows up. The rest of the book is really just filler. That's really all it is. But more, more importantly, then he talks about becoming a father and the kind of responsibility of becoming a father. And then of uh, becoming a lawyer for the first time and oftentimes traveling up north and, and uh, seeing uh, that the judges that he would go to court with would often mistake him for the accused. And, uh, and one time at uh, uh, Heading, uh, Headingley or no, the Remand Center, that he was uh, not allowed to leave by the, prison, by the guards because he, they said that you are one of the... He, he was defending uh, a non-Indigenous lawyer who had gotten a DUI that weekend. And uh, on a Saturday night, he went and consulted with his client and they let the uh, lawyer guy who had gotten the DUI out and they refused to let my father leave. And that's, 
a typical story of the kind of things that my dad experienced growing up because he was always a first in every room he entered. Every room. Courtroom, boardroom, classroom, often many living rooms that he would meet people and clients and communities. <clears throat> and I can remember as a young man when I used to go travel with him, uh, he would take me uh, to court and First Nations across, across uh, different elements of Manitoba. And I don't really remember the court so much. I don't really remember um, the battles that he might have had with a judge or another lawyer. But here's what I do remember. Every time we would leave the community center or the bingo hall or the gym that we were at where court would be held on First Nations all throughout the north, there would be an, uh, a lineup of young people usually held by their ear by their grandmother saying, this is your lawyer a lineup of First Nations people who would turn to my father and want them to represent their children in their battles with the legal system. And so uh, eventually when my father becomes a judge and the first Indigenous judge in Manitoba history in 1988, within that, oh, yes, <laughs> again, I did that. Anyways, uh, I'm just joking. In 1988, it's no coincidence that the same week that my father becomes a judge, J.J. Harper is shot. And that sets forth a series of, of uh, events where my father then heads up the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry with Justice Hamilton, who was never really Justice Hamilton to me. He was always Uncle Al. He was always a, a real big figure in my life because he was always around the house and I found him to be such a, such a kind man. But my father tells very funny stories about Justice Hamilton, uh, including one very funny story of them both pulling tabs on a Northern First Nation as a fundraiser. And my dad, uh, I don't know if I should give away the story. I'll give it away the story. It doesn't matter. It's a great story. Uh, he won a little bit of money. It was a tiny little bit of money, but Justice Hamilton won a considerable amount, more amount of money, uh, but my father donated the money back to the First Nation community, to the community center, and Justice Hamilton was less hesitant, was more hesitant of this large pot of money to donate it back. <laughs> and so uh, there's really wonderful stories of the camaraderie between the two of them, which then leads, of course, to the uh, stories of the pediatric cardiac inquest, which is, I think, the most unknown part of my father's career. But with all frank honesty, I can tell you that that is the part that has lasted the most for him. When he studied the deaths of children at the Health Science Center by a absolute corrupt and problematic and fraught with problems cardiac unit that was working on children, that traumatized my father for years. And it was only at the beginning of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where he felt a little bit of healing because the pain of understanding that children were put in the hands, vulnerable children, were put in the hands of doctors who then uh, treated them with such disrespect and disregard that that trauma carried through for my father and triggered many different feelings in his life involving his own feelings of uh, pain and um, uh, vulnerability involving his own father and my grandfather who suffered a lot with alcohol. It involved him feeling alone after my Uncle Richard was killed and murdered when he was 17 years old. It involved my father feeling a whole different series of vulnerability when in his 20s he had a little boy in his arms, a little girl in his arms, and he didn't know how to give them anything. And so that pediatric inquest is such a pivotal and important part of my father's career uh, that for many years he went into depression and he suffered for many years, and it was only upon uh, then finally uh, being appointed to the Court of Queen's Bench, now King's Bench, and then eventually the Truth, Re Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that then most of you or many Canadians met him for the very first time. But we always knew him as dad, as a baseball coach, as a former goalie. He was uh, always a guy that loved hockey. And uh, he probably tells the worst jokes I've ever heard in my entire life. And now I try to live up to that standard as a dad myself. Um, so some of you have all, of course, know, I don't have to recount the, the, his career as a, as a commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission alongside Chief Wilton Littlechild and uh, Dr. Marie Wilson. Uh, but we all know the impact that that has had on the country. No commission, no inquiry, no report has ever had the impact that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has had.
And it's in large part uh, because of the commitment that those three commissioners had with each other. The fact that they had each other's backs, they believed in each other, and on the very first weekend of the TRC, after it had fallen apart the first time with the first set of commissioners, my father took the uh, Chief Wilton Little Child and Dr. Marie Wilson, and they drove to Elkhorn. And this is a very Manitoba kind of experience. And they drove to Elkhorn. Uh, I don't know, do you know Elkhorn? Ever been to Elkhorn? Um, I actually write about Elkhorn in my book because my great aunt was a student there. Oh, okay. Well, this is a resort. Oh, so, I'm talking about the residential your, school. Your story is way about, cooler. Okay, no, I don't know. I think maybe. I'm talking maybe. about like a spa. Okay. No. But more importantly, 100%. Well, I know. Yes, I've never same been Same community, though. but they, they now do tourism. So, oh. but yes, 100%. That, uh, Elkhorn is also well known for being a site of a residential school, a lot of, yeah, a lot of different yeah, yeah. Um But so he takes them to uh, this place and they make commitments and plan out the entire TRC over a weekend the entire trajectory of the next six years. But the rule that they made between the three of them, and it's talked about in the book, is that he makes them promise that they will never leave a room angry with each other. And they will never leave a room having not agreed on something. They don't have to agree on everything, but they have to agree on something. Mm -hmm. And he says that reconciliation is the bravery of staying in a room together even when you disagree. And that's the lesson that my father has for all of us, I think, when it comes to reconciliation, especially considering Orange Shirt Day. We are in a, yeah, that's right. Yeah. This week that we are in is always a very pivotal and important week where we face a lot of hard truths. But I think probably the biggest hard truth of all is how do we stay together? How do we face off against some very difficult stories and then stick together? And I think that that's a message that can carry us forward. Because when my father finally ends the final end of his career, or the final steps of his career, uh, it was an unintentional one. It was certainly an unplan unplanned one. I can remember when he sat us as a family together and told us that the government or the prime minister had called him to ask if he wished to be a senator, if he would allow his name to go forward to be a senator. He was nominated by the Indigenous community of Winnipeg, particularly the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg and the other chiefs organizations that we have within the city and the province. They all collectively came together and uniformly nominated my father to be part of the Senate and the Prime Minister then put his name forward. And it was a long time to make that decision for my father because he knew he had already left us for so many years. And one of the most painful speeches I've ever had to watch is my father... Uh, talking to the country at the final moment of the TRC and saying how much he had missed us when he had been at the TRC. And so for him to spend the final five years of his career in the Senate working on really important bills to protect aquatic animals, to make sure that those animals in a captivity would not be imprisoned, to make sure that LGBTQ people were included and recognized as having very unique and important roles and rights within society. And his famous speech at the Senate, which is to call the Senate a council of elders for the country, which I think is not a way that the Senate's ever been conceived before. It's often thought of as a very patronage, kind of a political place. But to think of it as a elder, a place of elders, I think is a really brilliant way to try to begin of revamping and revisiting the ideas of the Senate. And now that he's home, now that dad's home, uh, he has been uh, in the process of putting this book together and he's had to face a lot of hard truths. And I'm not gonna tell you it's easy. When you have spent a lifetime working for a country and sometimes at home uh, things have uh, continued without you, it's been very hard for my father, I think in many ways to come home and to be home, to be home for such a long period of time, especially for those of us who uh, wanted him home for a long period. And so it's been a bit of a struggle, but it's also been this real beautiful reawakening of our father and seeing the beauty of him as a Mushum and being a Mushum to his grandchildren and his, his five grandchildren that he has, one of them being my daughter, Sarah, Namiji Nibikwe, who he talks about as the stories that were the impetus for this book that he wanted to give to her. And so uh, I, I invite you to enjoy these stories. I invite you to enjoy these moments in which he is reflecting upon stories that he has never even told us. Uh, the, our children never knew, I would say, a large portion of this book. 
I did not know, for example, the story of my grandmother uh, telling all the girls at residential school to stay away from my grandfather because she wanted him first. I did not know the story of my uh, father having to be imprisoned in the remand center, being com confused for an inmate. Uh, I did not know the stories, um, so many different stories of that my father, for instance, the really famous story that you're going to hear him read later uh, about that time right behind the courthouse and what he said to that young man. Uh, I did not know that story. There are many stories in here that I discovered in the process of doing interviews with him, but I am not alone. You know, there are many people that he brought up in the country, and one of them is right beside me, right here. Um, Tanya and I just met for the very first time today, physically. That's true. Yep, but finally. we have had hundreds of messages with each yeah, other. That's right. Yeah. And we're and both columnists. We yeah. And, uh, and so you've probably read Tanya's work, and you've probably been experienced with her wonderful work with the Massey lectures and the different things. But what you might not know is that my dad has been working with you and yeah. working with you in Thunder Bay for yeah. quite a long time. Yeah. So do you want yeah. to tell people a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, um, that was a beautiful recap of the book, but you still have to read it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> No, it really is. I just have to say, um, I just got finished reading the book, and it is um, really stunning, you know. And one of the beautiful things about the book, I just have to say this right now, is um, it's like I can hear his voice in my head, and he's just telling you a story. You're sitting at the kitchen table, and you're getting a story, and I can hear him saying these stories. And it's so, it's wonderful. It's like sitting... It's like sitting with an uncle. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Um, and I came in, I, I, you know, I was listening to you give the recap. Um, I got to know your dad around the time of the TRC because my grandma told me to turn the TV set on and look at Murray Sinclair, you know? And I remember that. I remember that. And she's like, she was his biggest fan. She was. And I think I speak for a lot of First Nations people Métis and Inuit even, and when I say that your father has done so much for all of our families, you know, um, and I got to know your dad because he read my first book as well, Seven Fallen Feathers, and he read Seven Fallen Feathers, and I met your dad when he was appointed as the lead investigator over the Thunder Bay Police Force, um, the police board. And just, I won't get into it too much, but if you haven't read Seven Fallen Feathers, it's a book about uh, seven children, seven students from Treaty 9 territory, Anishinaabe Asking Nation, I should say, because there's bits of Treaty 5 in there, territory in Northern Ontario. And a lot of um, the communities in the North, we don't have high schools. And so if you want a high school education, you've got to send your children to a city like Thunder Bay. And seven First Nations children died while obtaining a high school education between 2000 and 2011. So there was a big inquest into the deaths of the seven. And after that inquest happened, there was another investigation, and that was by the Ontario government, uh, looking at why it was this happened. What was wrong with the police force? Was there something going on? And so Murray was the one who was appointed, of course, because that's who you want, you know, the former chair of the TRC, to come to Thunder Bay and figure out what's going on with the police force. And so he held a series of fact-finding missions. He had people come and give testimony, and I was one of those people that he called. And I remember meeting him, and the first time that I met him, I extended my hand out to him, and I cried. You know, I just felt so overwhelmed because I was thinking about my family, and I was thinking about all of our families and how much work Murray had done for everybody you know, by leading that commission and all of the things he'd done. Like my grandma, she was here just outside of Brandon, right? And so she was in Manitoba. She knew your dad as a judge and as justice. And, you know, it was like, wow, he's a niche guy and he's a justice. Big deal, right? Um, and so that was when I first met him and we had a great conversation and he told me how much he admired my writing and he urged me to keep going. He urged me to keep going. And I told him that what he had written in the TRC was helpful to me. 
And if you haven't read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission final report, I'm going to ask you to read it. It's absolutely stunning. It is such an incredible work of truth. And I remember, this is later on, I, um, when I was writing my second book, All Our Relations, and I was a Massey lecturer, after I'd made that initial connection with your dad, I would send him emails asking him to help me <laughs> for advice. Because when I would get stuck with my writing, I felt like I, I needed some advice and I didn't know who to turn to. And I was reading the TRC, and so I would send him emails. And I think it was, it, you know, and, and I knew Lee Miracle too. She was a friend of mine. And it, you've, if you didn't know, Lee and Murray were very good friends. They were very, very dear friends. And she was like, yeah, just email him, ask him questions, it'll be fine. And your father was incredibly, incredibly helpful to me. Um, he always said he wrote the TRC to arm the reasonable. You know, he wanted to reach Canadians, non-Indigenous Canadians. He wanted them to understand what had happened in this country and to change their minds, right? And so the reasonable could tell the others the truth. And so I have to tell a little tiny story and then we're going to get back into reading the, or talking about the book because this actually has to do with the book. Because in the Massey lectures, Murray had written a story for the Globe and Mail about questions every single Anishinaabe person needs to ask themselves. He <laughs> And so I had written my book, All Our Relations. I had seen what Murray had done, and um, I had to write All Our Relations in five months. That's a whole other story. Um, and so I had reached out to him, and when he finally got back to me, I said, I, hey, I want to ask you about those three questions that you've got that every single Anishinaabe person should ask themselves. And he's like, three? I think you're missing one. Unless the Globe and Mail's made a massive mistake in the piece I wrote, there were four. And I still have that email, and it just makes me laugh because, yeah, he was right. There were four questions. And those four questions, though, we, he, we talked about them. We went back and forward um, over an email exchange over those four questions, and that really honed all our relations together. That honed the Massey lectures together. It made me realize what I was really doing and talking about, belonging. It was about belonging right? Telling our people where, who we are and where we come from. As an Anishinaabe person, the circle, where do we fit in the continuum? What is our role for community? And so then we talked about that, and that became my rock for the lectures. And then when I received this book, I loved the fact that he built the book around the four questions, because of course he did. He's still teaching us. He's still teaching us. So I wanted to ask you about the structure of Well, you book. don't know what the first plan was, <laughs> in which I stopped. He wanted to build it around the ugly duckling. That's what he wanted. That would be a totally different book if it was like the ugly duckling, Murray Sinclair. <laughs> like, that would be a totally different book. Now, if you read the book, you know that the ugly duckling is a really important story that he tells Sarah. And so the first thing that, he, that we wrote together was the ugly duckling story. So just to, just to be clear, that was his first vision. I was like, dad, that's not gonna work. That's not, we can't make that story last like 300 pages. And at the time he was reading Obama's, I'm giving you like inside gossip now. He was reading Obama, he's like, I want it to be just like that. I'm like, well, it won't start with the ugly duckling. Like, and so, but yes, the four questions, so. Yeah, the four questions, and there is a lot of ugly duckling in the book. Yeah, there is, yeah, he talks about it a lot, you know, and I, but I love that, you know, because he also talks a lot about in the book, um, he talks about, especially when he's looking at where do I come from, he's talking about himself, right? And how he felt as a young man and how he felt growing up and how when they left community and went to Winnipeg, how things were so incredibly different, right? How suddenly people were looking at him differently and suddenly he was experiencing racism, you know, it was right in front of his face all the time. And so he felt this ugly duckling, right? And that 
it was, I found it incredibly beautiful that he was talking about that. But I agree, it would have been a lot over 300 pages. <laughs> it's like, well, uh, how, many, <laughs> how many times can we <laughs> use the metaphor of swan? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so there's two, like the two main theory, or the two main sort of themes in the book, though, are being a musham. Like, yeah. what does that mean? And being, you know, sharing stories when you've gone all this experience and this path. And, and so there's this kind of musham, grandfather, uh, teacher like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is the message of the of when when I was a lawyer and I got fired for the Confederacy of Nations this is what I learned uh, when I traveled uh, and I went to South Africa or I went to New York and I worked with judges and I trained judges on uh, what it's like to assemble jur juries this is what I learned those kinds of musham feelings mm -hmm. and then there's this other part of the book which is uh, kind of a call to the nation and, and a way that to see through the microcosm of his own experience in his life, um, coming to Selkirk, uh, being a part of a removed community, but then also becoming a judge or a lawyer, then becoming a judge and then becoming a commissioner and then becoming uh, then an even bigger judge, a court of Queens judge, and then eventually becoming then the TRC and the Senator and, and all the different elements that in each stage there, he was encountering similar forms of racism. And the famous story that he tells in the book is on his first week as being Manitoba's first Indigenous judge, uh, one of the other judges uh, turned to him and uh, said, well, you know, Murray, you're only here because you're an Indigenous person and we feel bad. And he turned to the judge and said, well, you're only here because you're a white guy. So good. That was so good. And... And... The, the point of telling that story isn't to sort of show how he was combative, but to show often how he could turn things around with humor because it was actually meant to, uh, and then he tells more story about how the two of them were lawyers who would often compete and what, da what the guy was really mad about was the fact that my dad won every case against him. And that's what he was really mad about. And so, uh, so the, that kind of way in which he used playful humor and storytelling uh, to continually and consistently point out things. So one of the things, for example, he tells a story a couple times of being mistaken for Elijah Harper. And uh, he even got a t-shirt one time from Elijah uh, that uh, Elijah gave him a gift one time at this gathering and the shirt said, I am not Elijah Harper. <laughs> because my dad kept getting mistaken for Elijah Harper. Like every, one time in Garden Sydney Mall, this whole family took pictures with him and and uh, then the guy walked away and said, oh, I'm so excited, I met Elijah Harper. And my dad was like signing books, Elijah Harper. Like, he, they wanted his autograph and so he signed Elijah Harper. <laughs> Anyways, that's the kind of thing my dad constantly did because what we're really talking about is we're talking about stereotyping, we're talking about kind of the ways in which uh, you know, indigenous peoples who are first or become public figures kind of deal with this double-edged sword of what that's like. We both know kind of a little bit of what that looks like. And then we also, uh, he also talks a lot about the kind of burden of being this person who uh, at times is recognized even when he doesn't know that he's being recognized and uh, on the streets of Ottawa or um, in here in Winnipeg. shopping malls, or people running towards him. And I think, was it you that he had? He had uh, somebody with no, my him. my sister Gejik. Oh sister yeah, Gejik yeah, it was your sister, yeah. that's right. And just running full force <laughs> right at him. And yeah, and, and like, so like you get a chronicle of like about four really interesting decades in Winnipeg and Manitoba and then later mm -hmm. Canada. And it's almost like the way that I think of this book is it's four questions of what we all face when we mature and we go through elements of life. But it's really the four questions that the country has been asking themselves since the constitutional debates that he talks about in this book as being the first time he really felt anger. Uh, he talks about the first time feeling anger against Pierre Trudeau when Pierre Trudeau said Indigenous peoples don't have any rights and they don't matter and we're definitely not including them in the Constitution. And he feeling really angry about that and that was kind of a call. And I was with my father about two weeks ago and, uh, and I said to him, you know, Dad, like, what was your motivation? Like, what was your motivation on why you did all of these things? And, and he said, I just felt called. And I felt really called. And it started with anger. So what really fired me was anger, but then I realized that 
when I was really doing it, that didn't last very long. When it, what kept me going was love. And it was for love for you. And it was love for my grandchildren. And, and even though sometimes he had trouble saying love, in many ways, this is a story about love. This is a story about him growing to love himself, uh, lear learning to love those around him, and then learning to love a country that sometimes didn't always love him back. That's so well said, you know. Um, I remember reading, like, you know, it's, it's such, there's parts in this book where it's just classic Murray, you know, like that was one of them was like, this is how he felt about Pierre Trudeau, just saying that. And then he also has some thoughts about Justin Trudeau in the book too. Actually, that's like newsworthy stuff. Let me tell you the page. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that if there's any reporters here, I know. Turn to page I know. 194. <laughs> yeah, it's I know. Like, it's just like, wow. It's just like, let it, you know, let it rip. Good, good for you. Good for you. Um, yes, we kind of do that. That's what we have to do every once in a while. Um, but those questions, though, I have to ask you, did he talk about those questions when you were growing up? I mean, like, where did those questions? Oh God, all the time. I mean, Especially when he <laughs> grounded you. Like, he's like, Mr. Really? Reconciliation like... until he grounds you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, totally. I remember one time I got trouble. I came home late or, I don't know. I can tell you a lot. I got in trouble a whole bunch of times. Um, but he would constantly sort of riff into these, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a traditional teaching. I'm like, Dad, like, am I grounded? I just got to listen to you for an hour. And so, but, but when he would tell this story the most about the four questions, because um, he told it a lot in speeches, you know, so like if you go to the speeches and you look up Murray Sinclair, you'll see the four questions happen a lot in a lot of speeches, especially around child welfare, especially around um, health, uh, and especially around when he eventually sort of talks about uh, what it is that Indigenous rights looks like. So how do we articulate that? Um, but one thing that when I heard it personally was uh, at Sweat Lodge, when we would be at Sweat, and uh, the handful of times I was with my father and uh, he would get the, like we had the drum around and, and when you get the drum you speak and, and when he would have the drum, it would be his turn. He would articulate that, uh, what is it that I'm searching here by returning to my mother, returning to my moment in which I am reborn, returning to the moment of the spirit when we are our most pure, uh, and then he would say, that is the time in which it's the most important to start asking yourself, why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? These four questions that are so critically important. Um, those are the times I heard it the most, is usually in ceremony. Yeah. Well, that's, that's beautiful. You know, I, I wondered about that. I wondered if he was like peppering you with the four questions over pancakes on Sunday morning. <laughs> Sometimes long road trips. I'm looking over at my siblings over there. If you take a long road trip with dad, my sister's like, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> wow. Well, it must say, you know, I know a lot of people that would find that actually beautiful, but it's totally different when you're the children, right? And you're growing up with the work your dad does. I mean, that's, it's a lot, right? It's who he is. He, um, in very many ways, he also personifies the seven grandfather teachings, right? I mean. Yeah. I mean, he's also a guy that like, you know, was a terrible roofer. I mean, <laughs> we don't talk about that in the book, right? But, um, but here, you know, uh, I'll tell you that one of the things that is, that really was a game changer and we're lucky that uh, my daughter's mother's here, that she is over there. Uh, she can attest to this as well as myself, is that when he became a grandfather, there was a real game changer moment. Two things happened when my, when my father became a grandfather. A, he became a grandfather, which was brain numbing for him. Um, and he drove up to, uh, we had Sarah uh, on reserve, uh, born at home. He came and lived with us literally uh, for a few days to holding Sarah, talking to Sarah. And uh, he just was just stare at her for hours, just staring at her. But the second thing that happened is very shortly following that, my father had a stroke and a small stroke. And that really personified hum his so mortality. We talked about today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, his, yeah. on the recording there. Yeah. And that mortality, that feeling of that I'm not invulnerable, that, that I, I can slow down and that I, mm -hmm. you know, I need to take care of myself. Um, I think began, began this moment, and as a person, personally, that was the first time he started treating me like an adult. 
mm. is when I became a father, but also when he realized that he wasn't going to be around forever. Mm. And so he he became a person who wasn't just a dad, but he also became, um, you know, a grandfather, a person who was tremendous, had tremendous joy. Mm. And let me tell you, my daughter took full advantage of this grandfather role. He one time she said, he "Oh yeah, that's like, very there's clear stories in here that are just." He, like one time she said, he said, uh, "What do you want me to? What do you want to do next week?" And she's like, "It's Halloween," and he and. <laughs> And uh, he's like, well, what do you want to do for Halloween? And she says, I want you to dress up as Shrek. Oh, yeah. That's, this is a good story. And so he goes out and rents a $500 Shrek costume <laughs> and then just follows kids around with a mask on, <laughs> walking around the neighborhood. And he had a gang by the end, didn't he? Or was he said he had like 20 Well, the kids way that he tells him. the story isn't what happened. But anyways... <laughs> Because I was there. He says I was by myself and taking 85 kids by myself around the neighborhood. Not quite, but okay. But he w I'll just say this. He was very popular because the entire night he refused to take the Shrek costume off. He kept the mask on, and so all these kids really thought this was Shrek. He was, like, walking around the neighborhood. And I didn't tell you about the time that, that Sarah said, you should dress up like a clown. And he showed up in full, like, scary, creepy clown out makeup and nose. And we were like, what? And, or I didn't even tell you about the time that he showed up as a bumblebee. He wrote about that. He said he was a bumblebee. Like, my dad in a full black leotard. There's a picture out there. Do we, do we have a picture? Do we still have that picture? Oh, yes. She's nodding. And we're going to use it. It's going to be a blackmail. Is well, what it is. You know, that surprised me about your dad as a bumblebee um, and the Shrek. I didn't know the Shrek story. But did you learn something? What surprised you? Did you have a story in here that you're like, wow? Huh. Um, I don't know if it surprised me, but I love the stories of him and my Uncle Buddy. Um, so my Uncle Buddy was born a year after my father, and the two of them were just... God, they're awful, the two of them. They just drove everybody crazy. And hearing the stories of uh, them getting up to their the adventures with Chum, the dog, or driving my grandfather crazy. And uh, my favorite story ever, he tells of Uncle Buddy, and Uncle Buddy's passed away now. Um, I love my Uncle Buddy very, very much. He's one of my uh, most favorite people in the universe. Uh, my Uncle <laughs> he they got in trouble, and so my grandfather said to um, my dad and Uncle Buddy, um, uh, go get, go and get a reed because I'm going to spank you. And so my dad, being the rather obedient man that he is, sits by his grandfather and, and he, he looks at Uncle Buddy and Uncle Buddy goes, okay, I'll do it. And so he goes out to the forest and uh, he takes my grandfather's, well, first of all, he takes my grandfather's pocket knife and he goes out to the forest and there is my dad waiting with his, with his grandfather and he knows he's going to get a whooping. So he gets a little nervous and he looks up at my grandfather, grandfather's looking down at him and then five minutes roll by and then 10 minutes roll by and 20 minutes roll by and half an hour roll by. And my grandfather turns to my father and says, he's not coming back, is he? <laughs> And then that was it. <laughs> that's, what was, that's how smart my Uncle Buddy was. He just I threw know. my dad to the wolves. I like said, that story too. good luck, brother. <laughs> yeah, I like that story too. So that too. story's in here too. Yeah. And speaking about brothers, though, there was loss too, you know. Um, there was a lot of loss in Murray's life early, right? I mean, his mom and then Richard. Yeah, so his mom, uh, my... My grandmother, who I never obviously met, uh, died when giving birth to Uncle Buddy. Um, and, uh, and there was a lots of, that created a trauma in the family that really the family never recovered from. As a result, that's what led my grandfather to giving up the children um, to my great-grandmother, my granny Kate. Um, but then also my Uncle Richard was murdered when he was, uh, he was fighting for this country, or he was training to fight for this country. And uh, he was murdered on a train by other soldiers and then um, thrown off that train. Um, and uh, the compensation that was created from that moment uh, resulted in my grandfather uh, really having a really hard time handling that large water, that large pocket of money. And uh, luckily, my uh, Granny Kate, um, to send my dad to law school, 
um, went and took that money from my grandfather, who was really drinking it away. And uh, his best friend was Tommy Prince, and they used to they used to sleep on the streets together, just over here. And uh, the two of them would look after each other, but part of that was they would uh, share their money, and so they were kind of using that money from Uncle Richard's death. And uh, my granny and Kate would come and take kind of took that money and then helped uh, send my father to university for the first time uh, when his first wave of university before he dropped out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, that's also the time period in which my father. Uh, uh, had to tell the horrible news to my grandmother that, oh, yes. to, that he wasn't going to be a priest. Yes, yes, she wanted him to become a priest. She yeah. had basically committed him his entire life. And this was a surprise to me, reading about this, about how since she had been um, in the nunnery, you know, she was spent so much time there, that that was the deal. She was going to have a member of her, of her family, either a nun, a child was going to be a nun or a priest. And I think it was your aunt said, no, I'm not going to be a nun. And, and basically it was decided by everybody that kind of went, Murray's going to be the priest. That's right. And so dad went to the Catholic church three times a week. Um, he learned all the things, did all the roles in the church. And then when he was 16, because he skipped two grades growing up, um, he was going to go to university and he wanted to go to university. And he said so he had to, he went to my, uh, he smartly went to my great grandfather first, his uh, Henry James. And he said, I want to go to university. And he said, I want no part of this. <laughs> go to your grandmother. And my dad took three days to finally ask her meekly, can I go to university? And she cried for two days after that because she always dreamt of him being a priest. And so, uh, can you imagine my father as a priest? I don't know. It's no, no, but you know, no, um, but he did uh, become a bit of a carpenter. That's kind of Jesus like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, all of those experiences though, like you can see who makes the man, right? I mean, like, so he had that experience with the church. He understood the Bible. Like he was, he was living it. He was living the, the, the Catholic upbringing. And so that would help him so much so later on in life, right? When he's presiding over survivors meetings and he is talking to survivors who had been in so many of these Catholic institutions, right? I also think it, it gave him a real understanding truly of Medewin, yes. uh, of our, of yeah. our culture yeah. and our ceremonies, yeah. because our ceremonies are meant to work with, uh, engage and appreciate others. Mm -hmm. our, our societies aren't meant to reject our mm -hmm. societies are meant to work with. And so I think his knowledge of the Bible gave him a real ethic and an understanding of uh, Christ and God and mm -hmm. a way of understanding the world. But then really when he uh, became a ceremonial person and he became a Bedouin man and, uh, you know, carried all the teachings of mm -hmm. drums and songs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, uh, that really, I think, led him to a deeper understanding mm -hmm. uh, because he sees the value of us as an autonomous people, as, a, right. as yeah. a people who have our own jurisdiction, our own spiritual mm -hmm. ways. And it's our responsibility to carry our ways mm -hmm. um, to that so that Christianity can also hear about us mm -hmm. and that Christianity can become stronger because of our strong tradition. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 no, it's true. I think it all fueled his work for being um, at the TRC. Absolutely. It was just uh, remarkable to me. Um, oh, do you want to do the piece? Okay, yeah. Much, okay. No, how much time do we have? Do we have? We're um, staying here till 10. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're, we're sleeping. We're sleeping. Ten. We rented this place till ten, and oh we're getting every gosh, penny. Oh my gosh! Did you all know that? Ten o'clock. I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. uh, um, yeah. So we can do the piece. I'm, I wanted to. I also wanted to say. Um, I'll read the poem right now. It, it, did you want to do that? That piece, or is, is that the one we're going to do? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. So, all right. Um, I don't know if you knew this about Murray, but he was a poet. Okay, you did? Or, you know, this is like, I thought it was a big secret, but I knew that because of our friend Lee Miracle. Lee told me um, that she was always trying to get Murray to write poetry and to publish poetry. And I was surprised by that when she first told me that because um, I didn't know, you know, that, that's, that this great lawyer and the TRC commissioner, but he was a poet. He had the heart of a poet. And... Um, 
there's poetry in this book, his poetry. And it is so beautiful because not only do we have the four questions in this book, and they frame the book, it's the structure of the book, but we also have poetry. And the, I thought that it would be really lovely to read to you the poem that is in this book that I think struck me the most. Um, yeah, and it's near the end of the book. And I'm going to read it, unless you want to. Okay. <laughs> well, I can't see right now because I don't have my glasses on, but I will be. Okay. All right. Yes. So this, um, it's, it's quite a poignant poem as well. And this book is very much a reflection. It's a reflection on his life. And you're absolutely right. A theme of this book is family and being a Musham being a grandfather and the love of seeing a granddaughter, grandchildren, and the love that he had for his family. You know, it's a book about regret too. Did I spend enough time? It's a book about shame. It's a book about all of the things that many of us feel as Anishinaabe, as First Nations people too, right? Um, and it's a beautiful circle, this book. And this is the poem that is um, at the end of the, the book, and it's called, As We Grow Old. As we grow old, the ground we walk on rises up so that as each of those few moments left to us pass by and we grow old and hair turns grayer still, we move a bit more slowly at such a speed we can see around us more of life today and feel we understand the present more. For we have lived among the weeds and trees from which it came, and we have much we want and need to say. It's beautiful. Uh, this uh book uh, has four poems. Uh, they are very beautiful poems. In fact, um, because of my father's illness, I had to take over uh, doing the audio part of this book. So uh, if you download the audio version, you'll hear uh, my father does the first quarter or so, and then I do the, third, the other three quarters of the book. But the other part of this book is a wonderful reading of uh, the TRC report or an element of the, the report uh, which talks about things like the principles of recommend, uh, reconciliation, uh, things like the section called What We Have Learned. Um, and it's read by our very good friend and our uh, distant cousin and relative, Sheila Rogers, who uh, sends her great love. Uh, she uh, wished she could be here. Um, I think she's, I don't think she's here, right? I'm just looking around, making sure she's not here. Because she sent a message earlier. She's not here, that's right. And I think she was saying that she's feeling like she's left out. Or she she's better not be, because she'd be up on the stage I was gonna if be she like, was here. Where are you, Sheila? Um, but uh, Sheila Rogers did an amazing job doing the reading of this. And uh, one person that we haven't mentioned so far, but I really want to spend a moment just acknowledging is, um, so this, this book was made with, uh, with two people predominantly. Of course, all of our family, and we can't forget that my uh, sister Danae, who's just over there, uh, she is the epic uh, person who runs uh, my father's affairs, answers emails, uh, helps him with a tremendous amount of work. Uh, she's really the person that is uh, there constantly for my father to make sure that he is uh, not only meeting deadlines and supporting other people that he's committed to, uh, but then just also making sure that he's loved and supported by all of us. And so she does incredible work. And so uh, give a little round of applause to my sister, Danae, over there. Um, there she is. She's just going to wave a little bit. or There she is right there. And uh, the other person that is so crucial and important, um, you know, we've given Stephanie her, do, her duty and her props, but her sister is uh, Sarah Sinclair. So Sarah is a incredible writer on her own right. Uh, she's an archivist and, and works within uh, academics and work. She works out on the East Coast. Uh, and my cousin Sarah, uh, when it came very clear 
uh, that my father and I, we, we would spend, we'd do all these recordings and we'd spend a lot more time visiting than actually sort of compiling the book. And so then it didn't, we weren't being as efficient as we could be. And so uh, one thing Sarah did was she came in and she looked at our recordings. Uh, she also did a lot of recordings herself. And Sarah was really the person who did a lion's share of this book. Um, and so my cousin Sarah, she's not here, but please send a big round of applause to my cousin Sarah for getting this book done. Uh, because if, if not for Sarah, uh, really, I'd still be working on this in my kitchen table and it would never, ever get done. Um, and so there's all a host of bunch of other people as well, a uh, bunch of other people at Penguin uh, who uh, have been so committed in McClellan and Stewart to get this book and bring it to life. Um, and so we're just so honored that you've all came tonight and could spend some time with us. Uh, I think we've got one more little thing that we're going to do and we're going to hand it over to Stephanie over here. So. I mean, now that we're here, it really does feel like a family affair, hey? <laughs> like, oh. and let's bring up my Uncle Jim. Where are you, Uncle Jim? <laughs> Why are we not giving the mic to Uncle Jim? Where is he? I saw him here earlier. Thank you so much to both of you for that delightful conversation. So we thought it would be meaningful to end tonight with Murray's voice bringing us to a close. So I'm really, really proud and delighted to be presenting an audio clip from the audiobook. Um, uh, so let's listen to Murray tell us a story uh, before we all say goodnight. He was just a kid, likely more inclined to checking car doors to see if they were unlocked than robbing someone. But here he was suddenly popping out of the dark from behind a telephone pole, so small he could easily hide behind it. Give me your fucking money, he commanded in as deep a voice as he could muster. I didn't normally park in the lane behind my office, especially in the winter when it got dark early. I preferred the underground parkade at the courthouse where I had an assigned spot. It made it easier to leave when I finished presiding over a long case load and listening to lawyers argue in front of me all day. That morning, I had driven my truck to work though and it was far too tall to fit in the parkade. So, the lane it was. It was not too cold for a Manitoba winter's day, but I had still started the truck from my office window to warm it up before I went out. That's probably how he knew I was coming. Excuse me, I asked him although I knew perfectly well what was going on. I had never been robbed before, besides the time Wally Sinclair took 10 cents from me on her way to school in grade two, after pushing me down and going through my pockets. A story for later. I told you, give me your fucking money. The kid had his right hand in his pocket and pushed it forward for emphasis. I looked at him closely. I had plans to describe him accurately for the police. I couldn't make out his features, though. He wasn't looking at me, but around, checking to see if anyone was noticing what was happening. It was a dark and cold Manitoba day, though. It was just the two of us. I stared hard at him for a few seconds and then realized something. You don't recognize me, do you? I took off my hat to give him a better look. He stared at me for a few seconds, and then realization dawned on his face. Oh, shit. You were on my docket a few weeks ago for running away. I gave you a break. What the hell are you doing this for? When he appeared before me, the police had charged him for resisting arrest and escape. He had been caught running away from his foster home, and while in the police cruiser, had squirmed past the plastic shield between the front and back seats and taken off again. He was skinny, lanky, and smart. Appearing in my courtroom, he pleaded to the charge of running away from his foster placement, and the Crown stayed the more serious criminal code charge. I had asked him why he had run away. He told me that there were two older and bigger boys in the house who used him as a punching bag. He was constantly scared. He didn't know where to go, but he didn't want to get beaten up again. 
There was no way I was going back, he said to me. I granted him a discharge and told his social worker to find him a safer place to stay, giving the agency 24 hours to do so. I didn't expect to see him again, but here he was. A worker picked me up from the police station and put me in a hotel room, he sheepishly told me. I didn't have any money. I waited for hours for the worker to show up, but he was always late. I was hungry. I was surrounded by other kids who were dumped in hotel rooms, too. I felt alone, scared. I didn't want to be there. He kept looking around, frightened someone was going to stumble on our back lane meeting. I was willing to bet that if he had had a weapon, he would have flashed it by now. I remembered from his social worker's report that he was a good kid. He didn't use drugs or alcohol, had no known family members capable of caring for him, but had been labeled disobedient, so many foster homes wouldn't take him. He had reported being bullied in school, but no one did anything he had told me. He had also told me that the other kids were mean to foster kids, and so he refused to go back to school. He was also 16. Take your hand out of your pocket, I said to him, as if I would speak to my own son. I know you don't have a gun. He looked at me, then slowly pulled his hand out of his pocket. His hand was empty, but strangely, he kept his fingers in a gun shape. Here's the deal, I said. If you rob me, I'll call the cops. I know your name, don't forget. Robbing judges isn't looked at very kindly. You will be arrested. Then I'll have to go to court and testify, which is something I don't want to do. You'll be convicted and sent away until you're 18 at least, and maybe longer. His eyes softened, turning downward toward the pavement. But there's another way, he looked up. I don't want you to rob me, I said, meeting his eyes. I don't want to rob you either, he said. How much do you need? He shuffled his feet, flustered and confused. What? You're still broke and hungry, so you might just go and rob someone else. The next person you encounter may try to hurt you. He may have a gun or a knife. Maybe he'll be a weightlifter or a martial artist. Maybe you'll hurt them. He turned away, looking towards the street. Suddenly, a couple walked by the opening, unaware of what was happening. Ten bucks, he told me. Ask me to borrow it, I said to him. What? Ask me to lend you ten bucks, I repeated. I can't pay you back. Don't worry about that. Ask me. Can I borrow ten bucks? I dug in my pocket and took out what I had. Here's forty. How will I pay you back? Don't worry about it. Just promise me you'll try to stay out of trouble. I promise. That means no more trying to rob people. I promise. If it's okay, I want to ask you to do one more thing. Go back to school. If anyone gives you problems, tell them I asked you to try. If no one will help you, contact me. I'll get things sorted out. Here's my card. Yes, sir. Now get going. He put the cash in his pocket and looked back at me. Thank you, he said. Then he walked away down the lane, all the while looking at my card. I never heard from him again, but from time to time, I would check the dockets looking for his name. I never did find it. I've long since forgotten that young man's name. Over the years, I've met hundreds of thousands of people, almost all of whose names I've misplaced, but replaced with the circumstances and feelings of meeting and talking. The fact I've forgotten his name is not surprising, but I've never forgotten this incident. I hope that young man made it. He deserved to. And if he did, I am glad I had a small hand in it. I hope he knows that the gift he gave me is a beautiful one. 
because that young man could have also been me. Enormous gratitude to Tanya Talaga and Nigan Sinclair. Thank you again. And one more hooray for Murray. <laughs> Thank you so much.